1 Kings 11 is one of the saddest chapters in the Bible. It's also a pivotal chapter in the Old Testament. It's kind of the fulcrum on which the whole history of Israel turns, never to be the same again. Surely in the whole history of humankind, very few people have reached as high and fallen as low as Solomon. In my opinion, his high point was the dedication of his magnificent temple and his great prayer. And God showed his approval and acceptance by sending his glory down to fill that temple. And yet within a few years, Solomon was groveling in the murky world of the occult. And we need to ask ourselves, how did that come about? Well, I even thought I saw some straws in the wind, even at his height. That prayer of his, go back and look at it. It's a wonderful prayer. It's theologically excellent. It's full of respect for God. But what I feel is lacking is any indication of love for God in Solomon. I don't think we ever read that Solomon loved God or that Solomon had a heart that longed after God. Not like his father David, who said it time and again, for example, in one of the Psalms, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. Not in Solomon. Have you ever wondered what was Solomon's besetting sin? Now, it's very easy to say it was women. Verse 1 is wonderfully translated in the message, Solomon was obsessed with women. Now, frankly, I think most men are a bit obsessed with women. I saw a survey done that said the average man thinks about sex 19 times a day. I heard it said that the weaker sex is the stronger sex because of the stronger sex's weakness for the weaker sex. Now, I don't know if Solomon was more highly sexed than the average man. Perhaps the difference was rather that Solomon was in a position where he could live out his fantasies into practice and no one could speak against it. But I don't think women were his besetting sin. They were his Achilles heel, but they weren't the underlying cause of what happened. To explain what I mean, we need to go back to the Enneagram, that nine-pointed study of personality types that I find so insightful. Solomon was a classic number three, the achiever, and he achieved incredibly. You just need to go back to the last talk and look at that again. Now, each of these nine is driven by something. And the number three is driven by the need to succeed, and many of them do succeed. I don't think we'd have invented the wheel yet if it hadn't been for number threes. They're also driven for a need to look good. And the amazing thing is they often do. They're often good looking, have wonderful hair, seldom see a bald one. Look at Ronald Reagan, aged 80. Look at that hair. And there's no transplant there like Donald Trump's. They said that he didn't dye his hair. Well, you might believe that, but number threes are prone to put on an appearance and deceive you, and what you get is not exactly what you see. So he would never have told you if he dyed his hair. But look how smooth he is in public. In his second election as president, his age had become a real issue. Watch how smoothly he gets out of it and completely floors his opponent. You already are the oldest president in history. Is there any doubt in your mind that you would be able to function in such circumstances? Not at all, Mr. Truitt, and I, and I want you to know that also I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. <laughs> Now, in all nine of these personalities, when they're what we call redeemed, they have wonderful gifts to give. And one of the great gifts is leadership. And my word, do we need good leadership in the world? Because people follow number threes. And at their very best, they make great evangelists because people are drawn to them. Look at Billy Graham, aged 80. Look at that hair. By the way, no attempt to dye it. There was no deceit in that man. And still so good looking. But when a number three is not redeemed, then their besetting sin emerges. And their besetting sin is shallowness. Now, looking at Solomon, you would never call him shallow. He knew so much. He had such deep insight into human beings. He wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, which was a very deep book. But shallow in the sense 
that they put all of their focus on exteriors and how they look and they therefore can ignore what's actually going on inside them. There was a very wealthy man who bought an expensive yacht and he beautified it. He added an extra deck on the top of it. He put in a swimming pool as you can see. He installed a complete full-size billiard table that could be folded away. You know how heavy those are. The Commodore of the club came and looked aboard his boat and he said, I think you're making this boat a little top heavy. But the man ignored him and one evening he took all of his high-flying friends and associates out on a cruise. And while they were out, a severe squall came up and the boat turned over and many were drowned. He had not paid attention to what was below the waterline. And that's the sin of the three and of Solomon. He did not pay attention to what was below the waterline. He did not tend to his own heart. Sad because he was the one who said, My son, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. I love that word, wellspring. But Solomon didn't guard his heart. And so we come to verse 4, the key verse of this passage. Solomon's wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of his father David had been. He didn't tend his heart, and as a result, these heinous sins, he built even to the god Moloch a shrine, the most dreadful god of them all. Now we need to ask the question, David did some terrible things. Why were his sins forgiven? And what was so much worse about Solomon's? Well, a number of things. David's was one off and then he didn't do it again. Solomon never stopped doing what he was doing. David broke the sixth and seventh commandment. Solomon broke the first. David was a fool. Solomon's was deliberate. And with all that David did wrong, his heart remained towards God. Solomon's didn't. Solomon turned to other God. That's called apostasy. Now, strangely, that word apostasy, turning to another God, doesn't shake us very much these days. So perhaps I can use the word treason. Treason is where you turn against your own country and work to undermine it and bring it down. There was a famous Englishman who had the nickname of Lord Haw Haw. By the way, he had a terrible scar running from his ear to his mouth. It was given to him by a razor cut at a communist conference. He spent the Second World War broadcasting in his perfect upper-class English streams of anti-British and pro-German propaganda, and it was estimated he did a lot of damage to the morale in Britain. In 1946, he was hanged. They put him to death, as you should a traitor. Solomon was a traitor to God. He slapped him in the face. And of course there were consequences. The greater the sin, the greater the consequences. And the greater the man, the more people suffer those consequences. Actually, he didn't suffer very severe consequences himself. But his son did. That great empire that had stretched 1,600 kilometers was reduced to that little purple area 150 kilometers across. And what was worse is that yellow area represented the ten northern tribes that were ripped away from Rehoboam. And they were led into sin and into idolatry by Jeroboam. And in their 200 year history there is not a single king of the north that was not called evil. And after many warnings, after 200 years, God allowed them to be wiped from the map of history. They lost their identity. They lost their place in God's covenant. I believe because of Solomon's sin, million lost their salvation. And so, as I've done these studies, I've asked myself, how's my heart? It's not always easy to know your own heart. I've never been pushed to the limit where I think you do find out your heart. But what I do do often is I pray the prayer not of Solomon, but of his father. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Please.